So the second part of my talk is going to focus on breeding targets and also an uh, outline of how we actually do hybridization in Apple. What I've done for the breeding targets is to split them into three different areas. And the first one, which in my opinion is the most important, is fruit quality. So appearance and eating quality, uh, I think, have to be the most important fruit quality breeding traits. As far as appearance is concerned, consumers go out there and they're faced with a range of apple types on display whenever they go into a store. And they, they have to be drawn to a particular apple, uh, and that's really by its appearance. So they're shopping by eye. And over and above that, predominantly in this country, in the US, um, consumers can go in there and actually select individual fruit and then put them into a bag and pay and leave the shop. But what that means is that there, there can be a lot of picking over of the fruit display. And it's important for retailers that there isn't a lot of waste after that happens. So some varieties will and do show marks and bruises more than others. Some are just a little more robust. So all of those kind of things, in my opinion, form that appearance category. So if appearance is what draws the consumer in and makes them choose that variety in the first place to buy, it's really eating quality that determines the repeat purchase. And eating quality in Apple is a interesting mix of textural qualities. So that includes crispness, hardness, um, and juiciness as well as all of the, the flavoral components. So we look for a, a balance between acidity and sweetness. Um, obviously, some consumers prefer sweeter apples and some prefer more acidic apples. And then, of course, there's aroma on top of that. I've also included storability as a breeding target for fruit quality. When you uh, produce the sort of volume of apples that are produced on an annual basis uh, in somewhere like Washington State, you have to be able to store that fruit for sometimes up to 12 months of the year to ensure a, a good market uh, throughout the year. And so it's important for us that we not only breed apples that taste uh, and eat really well when they're fresh off the tree, but also apples that can maintain that kind of quality consistently throughout storage. Now there's a lot that be, can be done with technology in, in terms of improving the storage life of apples, but fundamentally if your apple doesn't have that, that those storage legs, if you like, in the first place, it's not going to make it. So that was my first set of, of breeding targets. The second set, production factors. I think high yield is, is self-explanatory. Um, and, and perhaps in apple, it's not as important as it is in some other crops, really because you can deal a lot uh, horticulturally with yield um, in terms of tree spacing and the structure of the tree. But it's still there still has to be a certain level of yield there um, to make it uh, a viable selection. Regular cropping can be a serious issue with apple. Some varieties, and Gala is a great example of this, um, can go into what's called a, a biennial cycle. And that means that one year they'll produce a huge crop of very small apples, and then that's followed by a year with almost no crop. Obviously, that's neither of those years work really well for the grower. You can manage it uh, horticulturally again to a certain extent by thinning the fruit, but that's expensive and labor intensive. And so if we can select um, varieties that are more regular cropping and are less likely to go into this biennial bearing cycle, um, we will be more successful. And then the third uh, production factor I've put in there is uh, cold tolerance and winter chill. Two kind of different things, but I've, I've linked them together here. Cold tolerance, obviously, for 
some areas where um, it's very difficult to grow many standard varieties of apple just because the winters are, to, are so cold. Uh, for example, Minnesota, and, and in fact, cold tolerance is a breeding target of the University of Minnesota breeding program. And then winter chill, I guess the opposite, where there just isn't enough uh, chilling uh, to produce or to make the tree produce fruit buds. So in some areas, uh, and uh, for example, South Africa, where they're facing warmer weather and fewer hours of winter chill, the developing new varieties that have a lower requirement for winter chill is really important. So my third and final set of breeding targets I've grouped together as resistances. Um, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but they're kind of resistances. Um, the first two, apple scab and powdery mildew, were both fungal diseases. Certainly apple scab, uh, breeding for resistance to apple scab, is one of the primary targets of almost every apple breeding program around the world, um, probably except mine. Um, and that is one, one of the reasons uh, is that in Washington, where we have such low humidity, we don't have... Um, much of a problem really with apple scab. However, in most other areas it really is a serious issue. Powdery mildew is certainly um, around pretty much everywhere where you grow apples, uh, including Washington, but perhaps not at, not at the sort of levels that it would be in many of the, for example, European production areas. Fire blight is a, a bacterial disease and can be devastating in the orchard. It, uh, a serious infection can leave you with trees that just look as if they've been burnt, hence the name. Uh, and certainly we have it here and it, and it is in most areas, most production areas of the world. Um, when I grouped together my resistances I also put sunburn in here. Now it's obviously not a disease but it is important in some areas to have some resistance to sunburn. Um, and, you know, I put this in really because here I am in Washington where sunburn can be a, a serious issue to apple production. One of the things that we find with sunburn is that, um, unfortunately, the, the apples don't get a chance to acclimatize to the level of light as, they, as they're growing. Um, what, what tends to happen is as the fruit gets larger and heavier, it usually means makes the branch bend, so it changes the position of the of the fruit on the tree, and therefore sometimes you can get a high a sudden high impact of, of light, high intensity light onto what can be a relatively mature apple. And so you'll find uh, sometimes the, the symptoms that you can see in the photograph. Um, and so for, for a breeding target for my program, uh, trying to find um, and select individuals that are resistant to sunburn is, is really quite important. So I'm going to move on to hybridization and how we actually cross, uh, how we make crosses in Apple now. Um, I think hopefully you can see from the, the diagram there that Apple has a, a relatively simple flower structure. It has a flower number of five, so everything is in multiples of five, which I think most people realize when they cut open the apple and get that, that five-pointed star in the middle. Um, if you look at the photograph on the top right-hand side, uh, this stage that's circled here in, in red is the, the stage of bud that we use for um, pretty much all of the crossing. We call that the popcorn stage. And really, it, it means that the, the, the bud is sort of fully swollen and just at the point before the petals start to open. So hopefully there's been uh, no insect already visiting that flower and bringing in stray pollen. So to collect the pollen, we use a, a pretty simple setup. Uh, the photograph on the bottom right shows a, a wire mesh over a Petri dish. We go out and harvest a whole load of these flower buds and then you can just rub them across the wire mesh. The anthers typically detach from the filaments and fall through the wire mesh into the petri dish and then you can discard everything else. 
And then if you leave that Petri dish out at room temperature, typically overnight or perhaps uh, two nights, then the anthers will dehiss and you'll get a fair amount of pollen there in your Petri dish. One nice thing about working with apple is that the pollen is fairly robust. Uh, you can store it in the Petri dish if you choose, uh, but typically in my program we transfer pollen into these glass vials, as you can see there on the bottom left. Just makes it sort of easier um, to store and uh, doesn't take up as much room, and we can uh, take them out into the field a little bit uh, more easily. Plus then if you drop them on the floor, they have a lid on and you don't lose all your pollen. The, the pollen can store in the freezer for several years, Typically, we'll put it in a box with some desiccant. I've fairly successfully used pollen that's five years old. I haven't really pushed it much beyond that, but uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it wouldn't last a little bit longer if needed. So to prepare the mother, um, we actually use uh, the same stage of bloom. You can see the picture on the top left shows um, the what, what we're doing is to remove all of the outer whorls of the flower, just leaving behind the stigmas. Um, we remove the petals predominantly because they form otherwise the, the principal target for the visiting insects. But if we remove the sepals as well, um, and it can be quite easy to do that just with your fingers, you can sort of pop the whole of the, the top of the bloom off. Uh, it really helps when you come back to try and um, identify which apples have been hand pollinated and which ones um, have not later on in the season. And I, hopefully you can see by that um, those odd looking apples down at the bottom right hand side what an apple looks like um, when you've removed the sepals at, at pollination. So you get this sort of just the, the empty uh, calyx end as opposed to the, the typical um, apple. Now you can get, and I have used in the past, uh, pollinating scissors that will uh, you can adapt by just cutting a small notch into both the blades and using them to cut around the, the, the uh, bud to remove all of these outer whorls. But from my experience, they haven't worked all that well in apple because the, the bud size tends to vary from one variety to the next. So when you've removed those outer whorls, you get left with uh, this sort of sad looking um, cluster of, of blooms that you can see on the top right hand side there with the, pretty much the very exposed stigmas, that's all you've got left. Um, we usually pollinate about three per cluster and we'll come and we'll repollinate uh, on the second day as well as, as um, when we're preparing them just to make sure that we've got good pollen receptivity. And you can see uh, from the bottom left photo that we just can use a paintbrush or more often than not now we use the eraser on the end of a pencil to pollinate. Um, it just gives you a little bit of extra reach sometimes um, and the, the pollen sticks nicely onto the, the eraser. So it's a fairly simple process, um, but of course, for the most part, when we're crossing, we're using trees that are out in the orchard. Um, that in itself is uh, can be problematic. Obviously, when we've prepared blooms and left these stigmas exposed, they're exposed to all the weather conditions um, that are out there, very, very sensitive to any frost and also to any wind damage. And of course, uh, although that's one level of uh, controlling the crossing, it's not, um, not totally controlled. We could still get visiting insects. Um, I've just illustrated here some of the other methods of control. You could, of course, just put a bag around the cluster as, it, as, as I showed it on the previous photograph. Um, or you could use a larger bag the photograph that you can see on the left there is a, a whole branch that's been bagged. Um, anybody who is particularly sharp-eyed might notice that that's a cherry rather than an apple tree in there. Um, I just couldn't find that apple photo. Um, but it's exactly the same for cherry. So uh, you can get these pollinating bags that are slightly porous and allow gas exchange and will protect the, the pollinated blooms uh, for as long as you need them on the tree. You can, of course, go uh, 
one stage beyond that and protect the whole tree. Um, and here, the, the picture in the middle there, you can see is a, a single tree that's, that's netted. Um, or even beyond that um, and, and net a whole row of trees, in which case you need a, a more substantial structure, uh, the one that you can see on the bottom right there. Um, and, and this is the sort of thing that if you're using trees that are on a trellis, uh, so in other words, they're supported by posts with wires in between them, uh, you often have to resort to that full uh, netting of a row if you want to, to um, totally control the hybridization. So then once you've, you've got to that point, you just really have to sit back and wait for the, wait for the fruit to grow. And then it's as simple as cutting the fruit in half, as you can see in the, the top right, taking out the seeds, washing the seeds, and then stratifying them on damp filter paper in a Petri dish for about 12 weeks before they'll start to germinate. And apple seeds are pretty robust as well. You can store them uh, relatively indefinitely. Um, uh, and then, uh, it, so if you need to to bulk up, if you if you can't make a, a large number of seeds in one year on a particular cross and you want to add more until you have sufficient seed. So uh, that moves me into the third part of my talk, uh, which is more specifically about uh, my breeding program at Washington State University.